Hello, this is Mark Kavor. This is a problem we've already solved in Excel using Solver, a linear program. And I want to go over it again because I want to emphasize looking at the output reports that Solver has. So I've set up the problem. If you recall, this is the, the actual problem. This is the setup. And if I go to Solver and I say, please solve or solve this problem, it gives me answers. It gives me 1.8 for x1, 20.8 for x2, 1.6 for x3, 268 is the optimal value of z, or in this case, I think you could call it p. And I've got my left-hand sides, 55, 55, 26, 26, 27.4, 30, 57, 57. So I can just look at the constraints. I see this is binding because I'm, the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. 26 equals 26, that's binding. 57 is equal to 57, that's binding constraint. 27.4 is less than 30, so I have some slack there of 2.6. Now, this is pretty obvious, but if I want to go to answers, sensitivity, and limits, and mostly we're going to use answers and sensitivity, and I keep the order keep the solver solution and I just hit OK it's going to print give me three more worksheets answer report 2 sensitivity report 2 limits report 2 this is for problem 2 it doesn't always if I run another one it'll call it answer report 3 etc I can go here and change these answer report and make it number 1 or whatever I want to do but that's not the point if I go here it tells me my optimum value is 268, as we saw. So if I didn't want to read it off my own, I could say optimal value. And if I want to do things like highlight, I can do all kinds of things. If I go here, here are my variables. And here is the final value. If we go back to the original problem statement, you'll see it's the same. 1.8, 20.8, 1.6, 268 for Z. I go to the answer report. There we are. If I can see which ones are binding, which constraints are binding, 55, 26, and 57 were binding, and the 27.4 was not binding, and there was a slack. That means it was underneath the, the value that was 30. Now, for a simple problem like this, it might I might not have needed that. I could read my answer easily, but this is already in a report format. If I want to come here, I could change the names of the variables to product 1, product 2, product 3, or actually be more specific. I could call the constraints other things and copy-paste this to use in a report. So that's where you would find the output and which constraints are binding and which ones are not. If I go to the sensitivity report, I get something else. As you know, I don't like to see decimal places uh, more than two. I don't think we need them for this kind of problem. And when I have something that's e, that's 1 times 10 to the 30th power, I'm going to call it infinity. And here's another variable that has many decimal places. Let's just reduce it to there, and let me let's justify that. Now I have my variable cells, and I have my constraints. I'm making them red just so you can see them a little bit better. And make them bigger. You don't have to do this. It's just what I'm doing for this video. These allowable increases, these have to do with what the book calls the range of feasibility and the range of optimality. The range of optimality is on the variable cells. The range of feasibility is down here. So if I call this range 
of feasibility. And what is that? What a crazy name for something that's actually easier to understand. And let's call this one range of optimality. The range of optimality says the following. Here's my constraints. I have 20 times x1 plus 10 times x2 plus 15 times x3. That was my original problem. 20x1, 10x2, 15x3. There they are. This says that I can increase 20 by 2.5. I can decrease it by 1.67. And if I don't change anything else in the problem, I will still get this final value. My z value is going to change because I've obviously changed one of the multipliers, but the solution will stay the same. That's called the range of optimality. So if I want to look at it as a lower limit and an upper limit, how would I calculate that? Well, I want to say this is equal to, the lower limit is going to be equal to the current coefficient minus the allowable decrease. So it takes it, it can go from 18.33 to what's the allowable increase. I still say equal the current objective of 20 plus now the allowable increase, which is 2.5. So it says if everything else stays the same and I move this 20 between 18.33 and 22.5, I will still get. 1.8, 20.8, and 1.6 is the answers to this. So that's the range of optimality for the first variable coefficient. If I copy this down, and again, uh, let's make everything two decimal places, I see the same kinds of ranges. It says like the range of the third variable, the coefficient is 15. It can go as low as 10 and as high as 22.5, and it will still get the same feasible, the same final solution of 1.8, 20.8, and 1.6 for x1, x2, x3. I can't change them at the same time. If I change this, if I change two of them, let's say I take 20 up to 22, and I take 10 down to to 9, it's no guarantee that this will be the final solution. It's only how much I can vary one at a time without changing anything else. Now the same thing happens for the range of feasibility. There's my still going to have upper or lower limit. I'm going to still cal calculate it the same way using an allowable increase and decrease. And if I just copy one of these and move it all down here, uh-oh, why do I have a value? Because I have infinity there, so let me just call this infinity 2. And let me left justify that, right justify that. So it says this tells me something else. This t is a... This feasibility has to do with the right-hand side of the constraint. These ranges of feasibility and optimal optimality on top, feasibility down here, has to do with this column of numbers. This is the right-hand side of the constraint, 55, 26, 30, 57. I want to say hike, I guess, there. But it's 55, 26, 30, 57. 55, 26, 30, 57. It's the right-hand side. It's the actual constraint limit. Same thing happens here. If I don't change anything else, 55 can go between 47 and 58.25. I will still get the same final values. Which means that the optimal result won't change when I change these. I can change this, this 26. I can go down to 18 up to 28. This one... I can go down to 27.4, but I can go as high as I want because we're not using the full constraint. It's not binding, so it's almost unlimited at the top. So even if I increase it, the right-hand side, it won't have any bearing on the problem. That's a constraint I wouldn't want to play with, almost a segue to the next thing. 
here's a constraint of 57. I can go down to 54 and up to 71.86, and it will not change this solution. It will not change this mix. It may change, the, and it won't change the optimum value. So that's the range of optimality, range of feasibility, and kind of the interpretation. The next thing we want to look at is shadow price. What is shadow price? This says if I increase this constraint by one. Now notice that the mix won't change. If I increase it by one to 56 because it's in the range of feasibility. I will increase the optimality by one. Instead of getting an optimal value of what was it? 268, I would get 269. If I increase this one, a constraint that's not binding, it won't have any bearing. The shadow price is zero because it's not binding. This constraint by one, I will again increase the optimal value by one. I'll go from 268 to 269. But if I increase this constraint, the one with 26 by one, the, the optimal value will go up by six. It will go from 268 to 274. That's really interesting. So if I'm going to change one constraint in this theory of constraints, this is my critical constraint right here. I, if I'm going to invest money in this process to try to improve my optimality, I want to work on moving this 26 up because every time I move it up at least one, I gain six. Here I move it up one, I only gain one in the objective function. So this is my critical critical constraint. And this goes right back to Goldratt's theory of constraints brought to life in a linear program. What did we talk about? We talked about once in solver, looking at the answer report and reading off the solution, which we could also do from our base spreadsheet, but this gives it to us in a different format. It tells us which constraints are binding and which constraints are not binding. And if there's any slack or surplus, surplus tends to happen in minimization problems. This is a maximization problem. And then we go to the sensitivity report, and we learned about the range of optimality and a range of feasibility. And we also learned about using the shadow price to determine the critical constraint. I want the shadow price that's the largest. When I have a maximization problem, when I have a minimization problem, I want the one that's the most minimum, usually negative minimum. Is if I the shadow price is negative, it means when I change the constraint by one, I will decrease the objective function. Thank you very much.